Hello and welcome to our next lecture. Today we'll be talking about special education needs students. Um, because special education needs is a very broad term, uh, I've divided all the lectures into three uh, sessions. Today we focus just on this lecture. Next time we'll be talking about visual impairment and then we'll be talking about gifted and talented learners. And briefly, the aims of our lecture. To develop an awareness of dyslexia among foreign language teachers, to show the ways in which dyslexia may be overcome, and finally to revise information about dyslexia, because I guess that most of you, you already discussed the issue um, on educational psychology classes or some other different classes. We focus on some information from genetics, right? Um, I will provide you with some update of information reading process skills associated with le language learning. Well, let's start from a very term of special education needs. Um, in the literature, you may find an abbreviation SEN that stands for special education needs. Um, what is interesting, it is the fact that um, the very term of SEN um, has changed in the last two or three decades. Um, what we may observe, these are the changes related, related to both the language that is used within this um, domain of special education needs and the scope of the term. Um, let's start from the language. What has changed in the very language that is used? Um, in the past, um, the students had problems were referred to in literature as not normal, subnormal, um, students who are not intelligent, mentally deficient, or you may even come across in literature such terms as idiot or moron, uh, educational subnormal person, right? But nowadays, um, there is this tendency of using more, you know, politically correct language, right? Uh, we substitute all these words with one universal term that is special education needs. Of course, the term is very, very broad. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, within special education needs students, we have students suffering from dyslexia, but also ADHD that we'll be not discussing here, um, students with different types of impairments hearing impairment, visual impairment, and gifted, talented students. Uh, what is interesting is that um, special education needs students might, they are different, right? There is some difference when we compare these students to, well, in inverted commas, normal students, right? They are definitely divined from the norm, but this difference may be either additive or subtractive. Subtractive if they, well, miss something, right? Just like in the case of visual impairment, when they have some, well, visible problems. But at the same time, special education needs students uh, may possess some neck for something, some gifts, some talents. So in this sense, they have something that is giving them extra, right? They have some additive um, gifts. So, uh, making the long story short, nowadays the scope of the term special education needs is much, much broader than it was in the past. Uh, within this uh, concept of SAN, we may distinguish two areas. There are sensory and physical needs um, problems of our students. Um, what I mean in this point, these are students suffering from hearing problems, right? Well, physical disabilities as well, right? Visual impairment. And the second area that might be distinguished, it's called, it's related to cognition and learning. So, when we are talking about dyslexia, we are actually focusing on the second area of, um, well, let's have a look at all these names. Disney, Churchill, Andersen Einstein, Bloom, Da Vinci, Hopkins, Tarantino, 
I guess that you are familiar with all the names. Most of them are, well, celebrities, writers, actors, well, people of eminence, right? But what do they all have in common? Well, all of them are dyslexics. Um, but, as you may see, they achieve some kind of success in different domains. So, what I want to say is that this is the myth that needs to be dispelled, that um, people who are suffering from dyslexia are actually, you know, poor learners, um, slow achievers at school. They, it is often the case, but it doesn't have to be like this, right? If they are provided with uh, good techniques, they may make up uh, for some deficiencies, right? And they may be actually as good as other learners. So, um, making the long story short, even if they have some deficiencies, in the long run they may be, well, equally successful um, with other learners. Well, if you, if you are not familiar with the term of dyslexia, well, have a look at what I have on in the slide. It should give you a hint what we are going to talk about. This is a word, dyslexia. As you may see, some of the letters are jumbled. Some of them are perceived by a dyslexic person as being upside down. Um, some of them are perceived as capital letters, right? Um, bigger than others. So this is what happens um, in the brain of a dyslexic person. So generally speaking, a dyslexic person has a problem with um, encoding um, information that is provided in the input, right? And now a crucial question is why should we bother about dyslexia? Um, at my classes, I can hear frequently the question, well, we've got a problem with a student. Uh, it seems that he or she is really talented uh, in foreign language learning, right? Uh, but he or she has a problem with writing. And you just wonder whether that person is dyslexic or not. Um, some other questions that arise on the way are, well, how should I evaluate a person? Should I assign the same task to a person who is a dyslexic? So definitely all these questions make me aware that uh, the issue of dyslexia is definitely um, a very current issue and we should, well, update information all the time from different, you know, uh, research findings to make some improvements uh, to our learners in the classroom. Uh, if you have a look at some data, uh, it is estimated that dyslexia occurs in 8% of population that makes about 2 million people worldwide. Um, definitely there are some problems with uh, the very term definition of the word dyslexia. Um, there is confusion and ambiguity about the term, but uh, I will explain later on uh, what is the source of this confusion. But definitely what is common to all the definitions is the fact that uh, it brings some anxiety. Anxiety both to, to teachers, parents, and definitely it's a source of anxiety for our foreign language learners. Um, some other argument for, uh, well, starting our deliberations about dyslexia in the classroom. Um, providing for assessment to this category of students. Should we treat these students in the same way um, as other students? And to be able to implement strategies for dyslexia identification and teaching, teaching effectively these students. And finally making curriculum accessible for such learners within an inclusive educational setting. Inclusive educational setting means that these learners are not excluded, right? They are treated in the same way as other students. There are no special schools for, for students suffering from dyslexia. That's why our well, main objective as teachers is to 
deal with two different categories of students. All right, students who are capable of writing without any errors and these who are dyslexics at the same time. Now, if you have a look at uh, etymology of the word dyslexia, um, it's, it's a coinage, right, of two words. Uh, Lexis, so a person has a problem with uh, vocabulary, right? I think that there is even a better term that I came across in literature, namely word blindness, um, which really, you know, implies what it means to be a dyslexic person. Such a person is just blind, doesn't see words correctly. And now let's focus on um, definition of dyslexia. When I came across different, you know, um, definitions in literature, I found some common features in all these definitions. But the first aspect that uh, emerges, um, this is the cause of dyslexia. Um, the authors claim that it's either neurological or genetic cause. Uh, neurological is related to weakness in processing speech sound. Um, that's why people suffering from dyslexia have problems with, you know, um, comprehension, uh, understanding, um, phonological layer of the language, right? And it's also related to uh, some problem with uh, the functioning of cerebellum. Um, I guess that you remember from your neurolinguistic classes or SLA classes that cerebellum is this part of the brain that is responsible for um, for keeping balance, right? For keeping balance, but at the same time, it's related to the functioning of front part of of, of your brain. Uh, which to, to a great extent is responsible for processing information related to language. So if the cerebellum does not function um, properly, uh, consequently there are some problems with the functioning of some areas of the front part of the brain and consequently problems with language. And there are also some genetic causes um, nowadays due to, you know, uh, well, recent technology innovations, we know that um, there are two chromosomes, namely chromosome number 6 and 15, that are involved allegedly in transmitting dyslexic condition. Um, once again, it's, well, it is uh, definitely uh, very ambiguous and disputable, I would say, more disputable, um, because um, well, I guess that you know some dyslexic students and most of them, if you ask them the question, do you have parents who are dyslexic? They would say, no, my parents do not have any problems. So, um, there might be some genetic cause, but definitely not necessarily, right? And uh, another common feature of all these definitions on dyslexia is that students suffering from dyslexia, they have problems um, related to processing, right? Processing, what kind of processing? Phonological, visual and auditory. And problems with uh, functioning of memory, with time management, processing, speed, organization, sequencing and planning. So these are all the, the aspects related to um, well, successful application of uh, learning strategies. In other words, maybe they have poor achievements, poor results at school, not because they are not capable of learning, but they don't know how to do it, because they're not aware of learning um, strategies, right? And another thing that appears in all these definition, definitions is need for overlearning and specific teaching approaching. I guess that you know the term of overlearning. Um, it appeared in audiolingual method. Um, overlearning is the process that well the students experience when they are exposed to well to input over and over again, right? So 
suddenly, you know, the learning process, well, it becomes automatic, right? So this is what happens actually uh, in the case of dyslexic students. We need to apply some specific teaching approaches to make them experience this overlearning, to make their learning automatic, right? And finally, um, when you compare definitions, you may also find that information that dyslexia may overlap with other conditions such as dyspraxia, dyscalculia and ADHD, right? Um, I think there is no point to explain ADHD that is related to the lack, of, well, not the lack, but uh, hyperactivity. This calculia is related to uh, inability to, well, to, to calculate correctly. But this press, I think it's, it's, well, indeed a very common phenomenon that accompanies dyslexia. It's related to your inability to focus on um, well, performing actions or movements, two actions or two movements at the same time. So, well, try to imagine a person who plays the piano, all right, and he or she is not able to do it at the same time with two hands. But, so this is what happens um, in, 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 in the people who suffer from this practice. All right, what emerges from all these definitions is also the fact that uh, dyslexia is treated uh, not as a kind of deficit, but rather as a difference. It may be uh, described in the following ways, this difference, right? First, how information is processed. Um, number two, strategies needed to learn effectively. So, these people just lack some knowledge, some background knowledge about how to learn effectively. Speed of processing, which means that, well, they are slower than others, right? And style of processing. And at this stage, I would like to focus your attention on the last point, namely style of processing. What happens um, in a dyslexic brain, uh, this is um, treating um, the input in a very global way. So if you have a look at, at uh, this picture that is on, on your right, well, you may see that a dyslexic brain is characterized with visual, right-brained global processing style, right? Now, if you think about language, I guess that you remember from my SLA classes that language is primarily processed and located in the left hemisphere, right? And the right hemisphere, in turn, processes information more globally. So this is what happens with that brain. To make you understand better what happens in, in the dyslexic brain, um, how it perceives information. Let's have a look at this uh, photo. Um, well, this is the prototype of an apple that is round and prototypical apple is red, let's say, right? For the majority of people of Western cultures, of course, right? And now what happens? If in the text you come across a word that is an apple, um, the brain triggers this image, prototypical apple. Now, try to compare this image of, that is triggered in your brain with what happens in the brain of dyslexic people. And this is what happens uh, in the brain of a dyslexic person. Um, as you may see, there are loads of other images that are generated in this brain. Um, all these pictures are somehow related to this prototypical apple, but they, the brain of a such a person treats the reality um, too globally, right? So instead of one prototypical apple, a person, well, switches from different images uh, such as the group of apples, Christmas time, 
Snow White, even Paradise, and so on and so on. So this, um, these associations are typical more for divergent brains and divergent thinking. Well, the dyslectic people do not just have problems with uh, images that are triggered, generated by their brains, but they also have problems with vision, with, um, with the perception, with the correct perception of a word. So, think about the situation. If in the text there is a word people, it may be perceived in the following ways by a dyslectic brain. So either the letters are jumbled, some of them are perceived as capital letters, or sometimes even the boundary lines between the words are not perceived correctly. So I guess that now you understand how this letter brain really works. So the main problem is that they see letters in line, P-E-O-L-P-E, -E, and they are not capable of seeing a word and at the same time linking this word to some prototypical image generated in the brain. Well, I guess you are tired at this stage so to have some fun right now I have a look at these pictures and try to answer the question how many faces can you see? And right now two more pictures for you. How many faces were you able to see? Well, a dyslectic person will be able to find 10 faces in all these pictures. And what about you? Well, no wonder that dyslectic people um, better perform on this task. Because they process information globally by means of their right hemisphere. Where does dyslexia come from? There are two types, sources of dyslexia. Well, firstly, uh, there are some neurological arguments. Um, the research findings show that the brain structure of dyslexic pupil is different. Uh, especially neural connections that are in the brain that are used for processing information, they develop differently. What is more, um, as you remember, this is the left hemisphere that is primarily responsible for processing information uh, related to, um, to language, right? It's especially um, essential for accurate reading and for phonological skills. But when the research is compared, what happens with dyslectic people, they notice that in dyslectic, in, in dyslectic people, this is the right hemisphere that processes the majority of this information, uh, which, as you remember, is related to more global, holistic um, processing. And what is more, we have some data from a very extensive uh, um, long-term study by Robertson and Bakker from 2002, uh, which suggests that learners who are suffering from dyslexia are sloppy readers, but, have a look, they may have good comprehension. So, even if they have problems with reading, it does not mean that they do not understand the text. And the second source of dyslexia is called glue ear. Um, glue ear is a phenomenon um, related to um, problems with ear that is blocked through colds which consequently may bring about con conductive hearing, uh, hearing loss. So it might happen at some stage of, of a child's life, uh, even, um, well, in, in adolescence time. Well, you may ask me the question, is it true that there is some correlation between uh, gender and dyslexia? Well, as you may see from this diagram, well, these are the boys who are more affected than girls. If you compare uh, the numbers, you may see that these are the boys who are three times 
are more affected um, by dyslexia than girls. There are basically two types of dyslexia. The first one is called acquired, that is related to early ear infection, right? Uh, this um, glue ear, so called. And the second type is called developmental, that is definitely congenital, and which is related to uh, typical brain anomalies. Well, we cannot just say that dyslexic students are poor students. Uh, they have poor memory and, well, they are doomed to be a failure in, well, learning anything, including foreign language learning. Definitely there are some strengths and weaknesses of these students. Well, as to good points, um, they have good visual skills, um, excellent expressive vocabulary, they might be good in team games, they might have good understanding of language. Um, but on the other hand, we may, we may diagnose some difficulties, such as these re related to remembering spelling rules, um, these related to reading aloud, and slow reading speed. Well, this is actually the first sign, we may say. Um, this is something that you, as foreign language teachers, you may notice. Um, in the first or second grade of the primary school, if a student is still very slow in reading um, and at the same time he or she is surpassed by the majority of, uh, of other peers in a classroom, it might be the sign that a person is a typical dyslexic student. And finally, they might have problems with uh, organizing their work with planning their work, with so-called successful learning strategies. And now, how can we recognize dyslexia in our students? Um, in my examples, I will focus on, on English, since we are foreign language teachers, and this is what you may notice at once, right? Difficulty in recognizing and remembering sounds in words especially PHTH problems. Have a look at these examples. These are real life examples from my students. Physician, Pujaris, so jumbled letters. Sometimes the jumbled syllables that you may notice. Necessity, all right, uh, commission. So I that some letters are not doubled or they double the letters because they remember that some letters should be doubled, you know, uh, in the words, but they actually use double letters uh, that should be actually single, right? Now, substitution of words with similar meanings when reading aloud. So, when they have a string of words in the text, they just focus their attention on the word bus, but instead of a bus, they read out car, or bike, or plane, or whatever, right? So once again, this is related to the global processing of the language. Do you remember the example that I gave you with an apple? So this is what happens. They think too globally and they have so many associations related to bus. So that when they focus their attention on bus, they do not see bus, but they see a car. And my conclusion is that it's difficult to read for them for accuracy and meaning at the same time. So either they focus on understanding what a given word means or they focus on uh, particular letters, right, and, and um, reading out correctly a word. What might be of much use for such students is definitely a pre-reading discussion about the text. So we introduce a topic to your student. So he or she knows that the text will not be about cars, but it will be about bus. And it facilitates, you know, comprehension of some words later on, right? And some other ways uh, which may help you recognize dyslexia in your students. They may have problems with rhyming, remembering nursery rhymes and sequence of the rhyme. I have a look at this very well-known well nursery rhyme. 
Hickory dickory dock, the clock struck one. The mouse ran up the clock, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. As you may notice, some lines are jumbled. So this is what happens with dyslexic people. Uh, what we may do as teachers, definitely, we may uh, improve their memory by assigning very short points, even two or three lines, and make the students memorize them. Uh, what else? They have problems with uh, rever reversing, omitting, or adding letters or words. So generally, these are the problems related to decoding, right? But they may be compensated by over-relying on context. And now we still continue with some symptoms of dyslexia in, in your students. Have a look at some other features. He or she loses the place when reading, right? What can we do to help him or her overcome the problem? Well, you may use a blank sheet of paper and to cover the text that is below and the text that is above to allow the student to focus his attention just on one line. Now, he or she may have difficulty with sequence of the alphabet, difficulty with pronouncing multisyllabic words, even common ones. Have a look. Necessity, preliminary, governmental. Um, this is something that is typical for the selected students. They do not have so many problems with uh, words that are one-syllable words, two-syllable words, but with multi-syllabic words. Um, a good idea is to introduce different colors that may be used to um, to assign to refer to different parts of speech. Um, so, for instance, nouns will be marked with green color, right? Or, um, well, red may be used to refer to verbs. Or you may actually ask your students to use different types of uh, different colors to refer to different multisyllabic words. So, if there are three syllabic words, use the yellow color, right? If there are four syllabic words, use uh, the green color, and so on and so on. But that it's, it's, it's very helpful. And finally, there is a poor word attack skills. Uh, there are poor word, word attack skills, particularly with learning unknown words. Uh, have a look at my example. Unbelievable. All right. Um, dyslexic people read the word visually, and they do not. They are not able to break it down into particular elements. So once again, what might be of much help is using colors, right? And dividing the words into three or more constituents. So summarizing our discussion, these are four points that you should take into consideration while teaching foreign language to dyslexic students. You should introduce pre-reading discussions so the students know what the text is about. If they know what the text is about, they will never ever read a car when they see a word bus in the text. You should also encourage learners to read. It's very important because these students, especially at some later stage of their life, when there are adolescent uh, students or other learners, uh, they feel somehow inferior. They might have problems with uh, you know, self-esteem. Uh, they think about them, themselves as being worse than others because they have problems with reading. So you should motivate them, encourage them to read anything. Allow the learners to self-correct. And finally, using colors that we discussed extensively before. Another great problem for dyslexic students is spelling. Once a word has been misspelled, it's difficult for the child to unlearn the error. Our problems with spelling rules, making phonological errors in spelling, especially F and substitute, substituting F for PH, changing the sequence of letters, right? This is what happens uh, in the case of dyslexic students. S and Z sounds are frequently changed, especially at the end of, of, uh, of a word. Have a look at my two examples. 
And another problem of dyslexic students is uh, writing. If you have a look at this uh, picture that is on your right, um, this is actually a written assignment of, of a child who is uh, 10. As you may see, a person has a problem with uh, the use of capital and small letters. Um, where well, basically these students are not consistent with the use of capital letters. So capital letters may appear at the very beginning of a word, at the final position or in, in, in the mid position. Um, definitely, uh, as it comes to uh, speed of writing, it's much, much slower than it is uh, in the case of other students. Um, what you may observe as, as foreign language teachers is there are reluctance to write anything in English, um, especially longer piece of writing. Um, what else? Um, as you may see, it's not just the matter of using big, uh, big and small letters, but it's also the matter of uh, well, this global processing of information, right? But the person is not able to focus his or her attention on a given assignment. So a person, uh, well, makes some drawings at the same time. Um, and his handwriting definitely is uh, very nasty. That may be attributed to some problems with uh, grip, right, writing grip, or with some problems with sitting posture. Now, what can we do to encourage our students uh, to writing? But well, first, we should provide a framework for the written piece. Uh, these students are very reluctant to write anything because they don't know how to do it. So it's a good idea to give them different opening phrases for introduction, for the main body of, of, of a letter, let's say. Uh, give them some ideas, uh, give them some prompts, um, I don't know, some nouns, some adjectives that they may use uh, in their written piece. Um, so this is what is included actually in the second point. Provide keywords to be used to speed up writing process. The writing process will go smoothly if you give them some prompts. All the special adapted pencils with rubber and sponge grips. Um, this is what I know from, from practice, that it's really, it's really a good idea if you allow your students to use pencils. Um, and finally, help students recognize the importance of good posture. As to their memory problems, well, definitely they have problems with uh, short-term memory and long-term memory. Uh, so what we may do is to give them some special assignments in which they'll practice their memory. Uh, in order not to discourage your learners, do not give them very long points or very long you know, list with words to memorize, but start from very short uh, pieces of information. So a nursery rhyme, okay, but just two or three lines, no more. Now, what about instructions? Uh, because there are some problems with understanding information, um, your instructions that you give to your students should be short and to, and to the point. Do not explain to your students um, any ideas. Do not give them any instructions using very sophisticated vocabulary. Use imperatives and use very short sentences. So, instead of would you be so kind as to open your book on page 35 and would you be so kind to read out the text? Say, read out the text, please. Open your book on page 34. Okay, apart from giving them very short information, um, you should also provide one piece of information at a time in order not to confuse your learners. So, not too much information at the same time. And teach your learners memory strategies to categorize information. Um, it's not enough to say to, to your dyslexic student, you should practice your memory uh, by memorizing points. Okay, but how can I do it? So, give them some hints. Explain that there is something that is called memory strategies. 
um, that they may associate some um, some words with some ideas, with some images in their in their brains, or with some colors. To give an example, um, this is a very short poem that you may use with your students um, to practice uh, the letters of the alphabet. A reminded him of a fat man with a big belly. E looks like his ear. I look like an ice cream with a cherry on top. O was his saucer bar. U was his plastic drinking cup. So this is what you may do with your students. And some more rhymes and short poems for you, which you may use with your child learners suffering from dyslexia. As to factors that you need to take into consideration while uh, teaching students uh, with dyslexia, well, firstly, you should think about the context. Um, what we mean by context is, first of all, uh, type of school, right? Uh, is it special school? It might happen that these learners, well, may be in special school, but it's not usually the case, right? It happens when uh, they have some other well, disabilities, handicaps, right? Type of school, class size, age of your learners, and training the staff have. Um, now, the assessment, strengths and difficulties experienced by learners. And the curriculum, which means what are the expectations placed on learners? To what extent is the curriculum accessible and differentiated? And finally, the learner. You should think what motivates him or her. Uh, you may check his or her learning style. And how can we use this information to develop a program? But well, definitely, this is a great problem for, for, for a teacher, not just for a student. Because you, as a foreign language teacher, your task is just to teach a foreign language. But having a dyslexic student means that you need to create some conditions for such a student to understand um, the input that you provide to him or her, right? Definitely it's not easy. But if you read out more about the application of all these techniques, definitely a dyslexic student may be equally successful with other learners. Well, in the world, including the European Union, um, there is education policy in which there is the focus on uh, individualized program for students who require some special needs. Of course, it also refers to students suffering from dyslexia. Um, you may use multisensory methods. Um, the most important, actually, um, assumption is that you should start from hearing, then saying, seeing and writing it. Means, make your student, first of all, exposed to hearing a word, then ask him to say it, then focus on the form and finally write it, right? But what happens in the majority of classrooms it is that hearing, saying, seeing and writing, all of them happen at the same time. So, while I do understand that it's know there are some time limits and there is no time for a foreign language teacher to come up to each student and to, you know, implement an individualized program, I do understand it. But at least what you may do is to uh, apply um, this method, multisensory method, right? Try to do it step by step. Do not write a word on the board and do not say it at the same time, all right? And number two, overlearning. I mentioned it before. In the case of the selected student, uh, what really is effective is making their learning automatic, all right? Um, in this way, they may overcome all the problems with memory um, because they just focus on repetition 
Um, and that learning is just like, you know, an automatic process. So, thank you for your attention. I wish you good luck with all your students, especially these who are suffering from dyslexia.